My name is Patty Phillips. I'm the academic dean at Moore College of Art Design, and I have the second opportunity to welcome you to um, this wonderful college. And I hope that yesterday was a day that was full and fruitful. Um, just going through the program, it's an incredible and impressive range and, and of depth and breadth of, of topics that you've been addressing in the conference. So um, I imagine you had just a great day yesterday, and it's been wonderful to sort of be able to kind of sit in and overhear some of the conversations going on this morning. So um, I, uh, we're delighted to have you here, and we also hope that it's been a really relevant experience for you to have your conference here in a school that is actively engaged in the practices of art and design and questions of teaching and learning and pedagogy. So I hope that the setting has engendered and supported um, rich and lively dialogues and discovery and inquiry. And again, we're delighted to have you here and I hope you have a terrific day again here at Moore and in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you. My name is Lauren Stichter. I'm the Graduate Program Director of the Master's in Art Education with an emphasis in special populations here at Moore College of Art and Design. I'm here just thrilled to have you all here. I have the great honor of introducing my uh, mentor and now wonderfully dear friend, Lynn Hornshack. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then we will welcome her up to share her story. Lynn taught here in the Philadelphia School District for 36 years and uh, with a modest estimation of about 500 kids per school over 36 years, that is 18,000 children. She's working with. Wow. That's the modest estimate. Throughout this time, Lynn has always had a heart for children and young adults with special needs. Through this love, she began the special needs in art education course here at Moore College of Art and Design for our undergrads and post baccalaureates. And in 2002, she was appointed chair of art education here at Moore. As mainstream increased in the K-12 setting over the years, Lynn identified an ever stronger need for teachers to be trained and equipped to work with a wide range of diverse learners in the art room. In 2008, Lynn Horshack was instrumental in creating the one-of-a-kind Masters of Art Education with an emphasis in special populations, currently the only one like in the country. The graduate program sponsors annual symposiums that bring in uh, nationally known speakers are talking and discussions around relevant topics uh, through the education of our education with those with special needs. Lynn has received just a few awards. The Outstanding Pennsylvania Higher Education Award, the Picasso Award from the Public Citizens for Children and Youth, the Bob and Penny Fox Distinguished Professor Award from Moore College of Art and Design, the Pennsylvania Outstanding Art Educator Year of the I'm sorry, Art Educator of the Year Award, and the Artwell Visionary Leader Award, Leader Award alongside Spike Lee. <laughs> Lynn is the past president of the Special Needs and Art Education Issues Group for the National Art Education Association. She is president-elect of the newly formed Division of the Arts for the Council for Exceptional Children, which is an international century-old association. In 2012, Lund co-authored a white paper with Beverly Levin Gerber entitled An Attack on the Tower of Babel, Creating a National Arts Special Education Resource Center for the Intersection of Arts and Special Education. In 2013, she co-authored a paper with two more grad alumni entitled Reflections on Moore College of Art and Design's Master's Degree Program in Art Education with an emphasis in special populations, both published by the Canadian <coughs> Center. She has authored two chapters in the soon-to-be-published book entitled Art for Children Experiencing Psychological Trauma, a Guide for Art Teachers and School-Based Professionals. She is highly celebrated here at Moore and by many, many across the station. And she is an artist and an educator. And we are honored to have her here today to share the story with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. 
I thank all of you for coming today. I want to, I love seeing your faces. Thank you for sharing your faces with me. Um, I want to thank uh, Katie Weir for a light breakfast that she put out and um, for more College of Art Design for paying for it and for Ken Ferretti who charmingly added a couple chairs so we would be able to fit everybody in. I'd like to thank my husband Will for coming. He did not make the original list but luckily, Lauren found a seat for him. <laughs> and uh, my son, Jordan, who came in from Houston, who's representing our other son, Evan, who's in California. Um, and for all of you who woke up early to get here, I have to say, this is the first time in a long time that I set my alarm, so I'd be here on time. And even with that, I woke up an hour early, so, you know, I was preparing to go. Okay. A long, long time ago, Lynn Horshack, Lynn Jordan Horshack, was raised in a small town called Truxill in upstate Pennsylvania. My high school graduating class was made up of 101 students. And the first elementary school that I was assigned to had over 1,000 students in it. And I know that because I was a Title I teacher. Anybody hired as a Title I teacher? Title I teacher, so I had to give a report, an intense report to the government every month, thus I knew how many students I was teaching. And so going from 101 in my high school to 1,000 in my elementary school is a little bit of a culture shock. So my journey to Clymer Elementary School in the District of Philadelphia began when I was six. You know, it's about that time when adults start asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I had three things on my plate. I wanted to be a ballet dancer, an artist, or perhaps a cowgirl. <laughs> and about age 16, this all kind of came together when my parents said to me, all right, Lynn, you have to choose between art lessons and ballet lessons. I chose art. And my dream about being a cowgirl, that sort of left me around age seven. And I wanted to, I wanted to major in fashion illustration until I had a summer job at a YWCA camp, camp of New York City in the Catskills. I taught those young girls art and I just fell in love. So I came back to Moore, my alma mater, and I changed my major to art education. My school climber is a boxy building with four stories and an elevator. It never worked. And I was on a cart. So I was getting all those art supplies up the steps, two rooms, and I quickly learned how to use that help Miss Jordan carry her art supplies from floor to floor as a way to get good behavior from my children. Hi, I still see faces I haven't seen. Sorry, I digress. I, 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 sorry. Um, and I learned, I tried to learn how I can paint with kids in somebody else's classroom without leaving too much of a mess. It was probably, I don't know, really early on in my teaching, second, third, fourth week, when I was talking to a sixth grade class. I was in the classroom, and I said something like, you know, it's like an ocean. And the classroom teacher was sitting in the back of the room, cramming for his bar exam. And he looked up at me, and I could just see the look on his face was like, oh, Lynn, that's just so naive. Because my kids at Climber had never had any experience with an ocean. So I learned right then that I needed to have specific <coughs> age-appropriate lessons. I need to make them want to engage in learning by having something that's meaningful for them. And um, going out on a limb here, I'm going out on a limb here saying that I just don't see how reproducing the color wheel is relevant to any kid's life. So love what you're doing makes life a joy. And I did love almost every minute teaching in the school district of Philadelphia. Except fourth period on Thursdays in my seventh or eighth year of teaching when room 403 came to art. 
those girls in that room did me in every week. Every week. And yes, there were times on Thursday afternoon that I cried, but I always went back. Luckily, when they got to fifth grade, the girls were kind of dispersed and I was back in my truck. And there was a fifth grade student named Clifton. He was um, very quiet, very reserved, and I had to work really hard to engage him in me and in the lesson. Uh, and it was working. We were having some kind of, we were, we were doing this together. Um, and by the way, my practice always, from the time I started teaching art, was to met and hang work throughout the building. And of course, at Climber, it was four stores, hang art. Um, so I told Clifton, you have done such a great job with this painting that I'm gonna hang it up. I went back next week to find Clifton again, depressed, withdrawn, not speaking to me. And I pressed him to see what was wrong. And he said, you said you would hang up my painting and you didn't, and I hadn't. And it was a tough lesson to learn. Yet again, another lesson to learn. I, like so many other people in Clifton's life, had let him down. So somehow or another, we managed to, to get together again, Clifton and I, and I always hung up his artwork, and I never made a promise to a kid that I didn't keep. And it's not always about teaching art, our teachers. It's not always about teaching art. Um, there was a little girl, first grader, putting on her coat at the end of the day. And she's right here by me. And she whispers to me, my mommy and daddy don't have any money because my daddy lost his job. So I went to the nurse because that's what we did in the school. We went to the nurse. And I asked the nurse if she would contact the parents to see if it would be okay with them if I brought food from my church's food cupboard to give to the family. Got the message back, yes, they, they would appreciate that. So that's what happened. For the next couple of months, I brought food from the food cupboard, took it to the nurse's office. Mom came into the nurse's office, got the food, and this went on for a while. And then one day, Mom comes running into the art room, all teary-eyed and all hugs that her husband had gotten a job and things were going to be just fine. And she said to me, I am, I've always been on the giving end of this, never the receiving end. And I just want to tell you how grateful I am. So I just want to say again, it's not always about teaching art. After 10 years at Clymer, I was transferred to Lush Elementary where I spent the next 26 years in the district. When I went to Lush, that was the time that the kids with disabilities were being taken out of the institutions, into homes, and into schools. I had no idea how to work with children in wheelchairs, feeding tubes, no language. And I had no resources. So starting from absolutely nothing, felt pretty safe because I didn't know anything and if I couldn't make a mistake and nobody else knew anything either so we just kind of plodded on trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, learning from my special needs kids was what made me the teacher that I grew into. Um, I learned to recognize their personalities of each child despite their disability or probably more because of their disability. I worked with what that child could do and went from there. Sometimes, often, we would do hand over hand, but it was always their marks. Not my marks, not a paraprofessional's marks. The same instructional strategies that I work, used to work with my special needs kids work with my regular kids. I watched how both the typical kids and special needs kids learned and supported one another in an included class. I would like to think that the children who interacted with special needs kids continued to be the kind and generous people that they were then. It was a good way to start. 
On Wednesday at 9 o'clock, I had a class of 9 and 10 year old kids with autism. And I've been teaching them since they were six, so we had a history together. On this particular day, we were supposed to be in the auditorium at 9.15. The art lesson was going to be, I was going to read to them where the wild things are. I think we all probably know that by heart, especially here in elementary school. And then they were going to make wild thing paper bag puppets. So we only had time for me to read the story where the wild things are, and then we got ourselves up and put it to the auditorium for the assembly. We sat the kids with autism in the back row, so they made strange noises, which they can do. Uh, they wouldn't disturb the other kids in the assembly. So we're sitting there waiting for the assembly to start, and Edith, the classroom aide, says, Lynn, Greg is crying. And I look over, and there, big, silent, huge tears are just dripping down Greg's cheeks. So I said, Greg, come on. We took him out into the hallway, and I said, he said to this nonverbal child, I said, Greg, what's the matter? And the nonverbal child said, art. He wanted art. He wanted to go back to the art room. So we did. Um, so reflecting on what went right and what went wrong during a lesson was important to me. I was the one in charge of the learning. If a class was too chaotic, and once or twice, once or twice it was too chaotic. It was, um, what did I do? What do I need to change? Was the lesson age appropriate? Was it meaningful for the kids? Did I encourage positive interaction among the students? What was my body language saying? Was there enough specific and heartfelt praise? Were the directions clear and sequential? And did that child's art reflect that child? If all the, all the art coming out of an art room starts to look the same, something is really wrong. You are working with all these kids that all look different, that are different, and their artwork needs to reflect those differences. It needs to be celebrated for those differences. I've been known to stop classes midway because I could tell I was frustrating them and I was getting frustrated. We would start again. There was no sin in that. While I was teaching at Lash and I adjunct at Moore and Tyler, um, I then became chair of our education here at Moore. I have a hard time saying no, so I kept on saying yes. And then I thought it would be a good idea to have a grad program that focused on teaching more to kids with disabilities. I went back to my roots, which was great. So as I look over the past 49 years of teaching, maybe I should have hung around for another 50. No, no, 49 is good. 49 years of teaching. I discovered that I love discovering, and that involves taking risks, just like we want our kids to take risks. I gladly took on challenges in teaching without knowing they were challenges. Oh, okay, teaching, painting with 30 kindergarten kids, why not? Sure, we can do that. So without the support, the encouragement, the wisdom, the patience from you, from my family, from all of my students, my elementary school students, my college students, grad students, from PAEA, from my mentors, my friends, my colleagues, student teachers, and visionaries. Without you, you, the village that formed me, I would not be standing here today. You have had a profound influence on my life. And for that, I am eternally grateful.
more minutes here. Enjoy the rest of your meal. Grab seconds and enjoy the rest of your time at the PAE conference. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.